How do you legally move a few dollars or millions of dollars in the U.S. banking system without it being tracked back to you? I've been showing people how to get financial privacy, financial anonymity, in fact, for 25 years. I get people out of debt situations, even during the middle of a levy or lawsuit. Then I create a legal fortress around the cash flow and assets that cannot be broken, even by the IRS. For some professionals and small business owners, I even have to use the dark web to handle large transactions invisibly. If you're still the personal signer for any bank account or not using the dark web for business, you're a sitting duck. Visit me at aceofcoins.com to learn the secrets to total financial privacy. In 1981, Garrison gave me a list of a bunch of people who are alive who should be questioned. Well, some of them are still alive. So we put together a wanted poster, which we deliver at the very end of the film to the Justice Department. And the other thing, the most important thing, the beginning of the film, Thomas Jefferson says you cannot have a successful democracy unless you have an informed public. And Mark Twain is quoted at the top of the film as saying, if you read American newspapers, if you don't read American newspapers, you're uninformed. But if you do, you're misinformed. The easiest way to correct everything is to reverse the Communications Act. No one has stood in front of President Trump. Now, President Trump talks about fake news, and he's trying his hardest, so he says to get the CIA to release the files. You know, and your father must know, or anybody in the military knows, that the CIA has no documents lying around, blueprints that said, this is how we murdered the president. They just don't exist. What it is they are fighting to release are Jim Garrison's files. They have 67 boxes with names of people who delivered the money, the names of the shooters, the names of the planters. In 2039, the law says that all the Warren Report files are supposed to come out, except Jim Garrison's. You won't find those for another 20 or 30 years. They will probably be destroyed. So those are the ones that they won't release, the Jim Garrison files. Now, what did you think when the Mockingbird media, the day before they were going to be released, were still spouting the official narrative? And then after those files did come out, which clearly, the ones that did come out clearly showed that the official narrative was wrong. Even the small amount they put, well, they put a large amount out, but they're... really juicy ones they didn't they left out but the ones they did put out shows that the official narrative is wrong and then the media went black what do you think about that what were you thinking during that process well it was quite laughable because absolutely nothing's going to come out but quite accidentally after uh the success of oliver stone's film which was again an aid in helping me to get to make my two movies when they passed the Assassinations Records Act in the mid-90s, they accidentally released two files, the most important files ever, which are in our film. And the first file, which proves complicity and cover-up, is dated 1967, addressed by the legal department or to the legal department at the CIA, to give aid to Clay Shaw, otherwise Mr. Garrison is going to be successful in his conviction of Mr. Shaw for conspiracy. And then the second file that was released was the file in which they said they had to create an attack against people like Mark Lane and Harold Weisberg and May Brussel. May Brussel, my God, just brilliant on the radio. She was on radio what Mark Lane was in print with Breast of Judgment. They had to malign these people, so they came up with what they called conspiracy theorists, and they must be aligned with the Communist Party and the threat to the United States national security. These memos are in the film. The film is irrefutable proof of the fact that these people murdered our president and continued to do so. They murdered Robert Kennedy. In the film, you see um, the autopsy report of my friend, Dr. Thomas Noguchi. As a matter of fact, in the mid 80s, when they were trying to get rid of Noguchi as the coroner of LA, myself and his lawyer set up the committee to retain an independent coroner, Thomas Noguchi, 
as coroner of Los Angeles County. And of course, we were defeated in that. But in the film, you see the fatal shot that struck Robert Kennedy struck no more than two and a half inches from the rear of the back of his head because of the extensive powder burns. And of course, Sirhan was never closer than six feet and in front of them. It's obvious. It's obvious they murdered Martin Luther King and they probably even murdered Malcolm X because when Malcolm X came back from Africa, he announced publicly, I've been wrong about separation. We have to all get together. And then, of course, he was off. Every peace candidate is murdered. So <laughs> why? And I, I know the answer to this. But what they want to change the idea of peace. That was their what the Mockingbird Media Project was about. What was our idea of peace, and what are they trying to change it to? It's or well said, peace, uh, perpetual war is peace. That's an exact quote almost from George Orwell. I mean, and look at now. You cannot, you know, Jim Garrison said this to me in 1981. He said, John, you know what America's like today? He said, it's like Nazi Germany. It's like Nuremberg in the middle 30s. You cannot go to a basketball game or a football game or a baseball game or a hockey game without seeing hundreds of military uniforms out there. It's just impossible. People do not realize the Pentagon pays millions of dollars to the NFL and the NBA and major league sports to mount these events. They're not doing it out of patriotic duty. They're doing it because they're paid to do it and they don't care about it. You know what? I'll tell you something. I believe if you're not fighting for the Constitution, you are not fighting for America. If you're fighting for General Electric or if you're fighting for Halliburton, you're fighting for the 12 families that own this country. You know, I believe deeply in the Constitution. I'm immensely inspired by the Constitution. But I'll tell you something that is rather ironic. Have you ever been called for jury duty? Alzheimer's and dementia are the most misunderstood, cruelest, and costly of all diseases. Dementia starts 30 to 50 years before symptoms appear. Every three seconds, someone gets diagnosed. 10% at age 65, 25% at age 75, and 50% at age 85 will be diagnosed. But symptoms are reversible despite what conventional medicine will tell you. Research has conclusively shown that what you do or don't do in your middle years can greatly impact your risk of Alzheimer's. Make simple changes discussed in the free 26-page report available below. You will also be signed up for the free summit when you download this free report. You will learn the best foods, herbs, and supplements for brain health. And by following these, it will dramatically reduce the chance you'll end up with this devastating issue. Take action now before memory loss is irreversible. Not yet, which I feel thankful for, actually. <laughs> I was called two years ago for jury duty, and I was anxious. I live in Las Vegas, and I like the community, and I thought I would like to be a part and do my part. I'm very grateful to America that I'm now a citizen. So they call us in, and there are about 45 of us standing in this courtroom, and the lady judge asks us all to arise, rise, raise our right hand, and pledge, uh, and, uh, uh, pledge to tell the truth on the Bible. And I don't stand and I don't raise my hand. And of course, she spots I'm the only one sitting and everybody's staring at me. So when it's over, she said, uh, sir, your name? I said, John Barber. She said, would you rise, please? So I stood up and she said, why didn't you pledge a lead, uh, to tell the truth on the Bible? Why, would you, why were you sitting? Do you mind telling me about that? And I said, well, dear, Your Honor, do you believe in the Constitution? She said, absolutely. That's why we're here. And I said, if you believe in the Constitution, why is the Bible in a courtroom? That's no place for the Bible. The Constitution should be here. If you have a copy of the Constitution in your drawer, you bring it out, bring it to me. I'll put my hand on it, and I'll swear to the Constitution to tell the truth. She said, sit down, Mr. Barber. I sat there for 12 hours till they dismissed me. They wouldn't have me on the court. 
They wouldn't let me do my civic duty, even though I asked to do that. So I believe. Why is a Bible in a courtroom in the United States? No, that everybody's shouting about put the Bible in a school. No, do not put the Bible in a school. You can certainly study the Bible if you're studying history or if you're studying literature. Study the Bible, study the Torah, the Koran, the st- all of that. But don't put a Bible in the school and don't put it in the courtroom. So the court the courts are a farce also. Well, the court, there's more. I can go way into the court system. Let's talk about the mob and the mob involvement with the JFK. People talk about there's this mob involvement and they don't know how far the mob is involved versus the CIA versus Cuba, you know, Castro. Is that more of a sidetrack? It is a sidetrack, and it began with G. Robert Blakey, that hack who became the head of the House Select Committee on Assassination. In the film, you will see information and a man you never even knew existed. His name is Richard Sprague, tough Philadelphia lawyer who got a lot of convictions of gangsters and Teamsters. And he was selected to be the first head of the House Select Committee to investigate the murder of John Kennedy and Martin Luther King. And he says publicly, we will solve this crime because we are not high. He had a staff of six. He said not one of the staff of six is from the Central Intelligence Agency or the FBI because they are organizations that we are going to investigate and subpoena their records. Well, of course, Americans do not know that Congress is loaded with CIA assets. The media is swamped with CIA assets. In the film, in the church hearings of the 70s, you see the head of the Central Intelligence Agency admit to Senator Church at that time they had 400 assets writing the news in the United States of America that was creating these fake wars. Now, this was during the Vietnam War when supposedly we had a real enemy. We don't have communists anymore. We never did have communists as a threat in this country. That's all bogus. So what do they invent? They invent fake terrorists. And as Gore Vidal said, he said, it's like fighting a war on Danbrook. (laughs) You'll never get over it. It'll always be there. And that is exactly what it is they're doing. Can you imagine if we had 400 then, how many more we must have now in the clergy, in the schools teaching us, in the police departments, in the military, everywhere. They're all, see, do you know that, uh, who was that famous chef, uh, the lady chef who kept, the drunkard who kept cutting herself? Do you know, street plater um, in that yeah. movie? Yes. Gloria, or, um, ugh, okay, I know who you're talking about. Sorry, it's not a tip of my tongue. Julia Child. Yes, yes. She was an intelligence officer. Really? She was, yes, she was CIA. Why? Gloria, Gloria Steinem was CIA. Look at, and, and this guy Bourdain, who just recently committed suicide. I do not believe anybody who travels the world doing anything, uh, whether it's selling little telephone parts or whether it's cooking food, I do not believe that is their main occupation. I believe somehow they are hirelings to the intelligence community in this country to learn to do something. And so How do learn- you tell? How do you, you can't, tell? You can't tell, but it's just, it's an educated guess. How can you tell if there's so many assets in media, for example, because you're more of an expert on media than maybe, you know, selling trinkets. How can you tell if somebody's a CIA asset or if... You can't. You know, when I was in 1969, you remember the Merv Griffin show? Yes. Okay, I was uh, was very successful on Merv's show, became a close friend of... Merv's, and when he left to go to CBS, he recommended me his replacement. And uh, Westinghouse put me under contract at $600 a week for 13 weeks while I uh, uh, tried to figure out what to do with me and David Frost, who was another person they were considering. And uh, guess who they hired to produce my show? Who? Roger, Roger Ailes. 
Roger Ailes at that time looked like Tyrone Power. I mean, he was the nicest looking, slenderest, dark haired fellow. He came to see me at the time. I was John Gary's opening act at the Fremont Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. So he came out for two days to watch me perform and to sit down and talk to me. And he he used to produce the Mike Douglas show. And Nixon was a guest and liked him. So hired him to be his uh, media consultant. And he was with Nixon forever. And uh, anyway, he was going to produce my show. So we used to talk about the news. And I said, well, you know, you weren't too successful with Nixon. I hope you're more successful with me. And he laughed. But when we were talking about the news, he said, John, it's not what you put on the news that changes the world. It's what you don't put on the news that changes the world. And that's what happened when he got to Fox. He didn't put on the truth about the large peace movement in this country that no longer exists. The peace movement that was trying to stop war criminal George Bush from destroying that ancient, wonderful culture that was Iraq. As a matter of fact, there's an ancient Persian proverb that said, if you're going to tell the truth, you better have one foot in the stirrup. Well, what do you think about now? I mean, it seems like the media has just completely gone, gone unhinged. What well, do you think's going on? Well, it's hard to say, but you can't get... I don't watch the mainstream news anymore. It's just... It, it, it's Vuzak. <laughs> what it is, it is totally meaningless. It's like the music you hear on an elevator. I it agree. is music. So you have to go to the internet. And again, in, in the documentary, we point out the dozen or, show person, dozen or so personalities and shows and books and things that you can go to to get the facts about the United States of America. You know, the best history book about this country was written by a fellow named Howard Zinn. It's called The, uh, People's, uh, the People's History of the United States. It is so brilliantly compiled because what it is, it's 600 pages of letters from ordinary Americans, struggling farmers, struggling workers, millionaires, autocrats, about what America means. I would recommend, that's the only history book you need to read about the United States. It's called The People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. There's a lot of wonderful stuff. There are lots of terrific and fabulous people out there. America's filled with geniuses for crying out loud, just filled with them, but they never rise to the top, never. Can you imagine, look at the presidents that we would have. Oh, we would be amazing if you would take the shackles, take that, get it off the backs of the greatness of so many people. We have the worst of the worst leading us and if you could get the best leading us and it really rose, we the whole country would transform. It would be and, amazing. And, and, you know, in the film, we also show Jimmy Carter talking about the fact that never America will never get back to what it was until we solve the John Kennedy murder. And, of course, they attempted to kill him. There was an assassination team arrested in Los Angeles that tried to kill Jimmy Carter. This is all in the film. This is information that's irrefutable. You know, only one major newspaper would even bother even looking at the film, and that was the L.A. Times. And they dismissed the film with a two-line review. And the two-line review was, they called it conspiracy porn, and it's written, produced by an angry curmudgeon named John Barber. Well, they got half of that review correct, because I am indeed an angry curmudgeon. <laughs> that is true. But of the thousands of facts in the film, they were not able to refute one of them. Yeah, it's just... So do you believe, like so many of us do, that the the cabal, whoever they are, have taken over this country since JFK and we've been under that control since? And do you see Trump is trying to turn that around? Or do you think that cabal has been in control much longer? Uh, the cabal has probably been in control since the birth of the country because when the country started, you could not vote if you were a female, you couldn't vote if you were black, and you couldn't uh, vote unless you were a property owner. 
So, so much for uh, democratic elections. And every advancement in this country to equal rights for anything has been almost a bloody struggle. And I, and I don't just say struggle, I mean a bloody struggle. People getting hurt and killed fighting for their rights in this country is supposedly granted by the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. I am I'm ambivalent about, uh, about Donald Trump. I didn't vote because I felt actually there was no one to vote for. And I remember a great line from Jack Parr, the best host of The Tonight Show. He says, I don't vote because it just encourages them. But uh, I leaned a lot towards Bernie Sanders because he was the only one talking about the issues of fake war, about student debt, about Wall Street corruption. But I said, a, a, a year ahead of it, I said, this guy's going to turn in to the uh, Democrats, Ron Paul. He was probably shocked by the fact that he had 12 million supporters and he had more youthful supporters than all of the other candidates combined, including Donald Trump. Donald Trump got equally large audiences, but they were all older. But Bernie Sanders got those who were under 25. And these people under 25 saw that there might be hope, but they realized it's hopeless. If you go to YouTube, Google my open letter to Bernie Sanders. It's very good. Also, Google my open letter to Robert De Niro, who three weeks ago at the Tony Awards said something really vile and out of line to Donald Trump. And again, I say, Donald Trump, you know, takes pride in the fact that he doesn't read a book. He uh, bragged about his uh, success groping women. Now, these are not qualities in a man or a president who in America create fans. It just creates voters. But I am behind his efforts to try to get the Central Intelligence Agency to release the files. But I'm still waiting for a newspaper man to say to him, Mr. President, if you think there is fake news, reverse the Communications Act. In 1963, when John Kennedy was killed, there were 1,500 individual owners of television and radio stations and newspapers in this country. Now it's down to six major corporations. Just reverse the Communications Act Give people like you, like yourself a bigger voice and you will change America to become a real people's democracy. Because what we have now is corporate socialism. You know, if Chrysler can't make a car that sells, I don't want my money going to them to bail them out. And the government calls it incentives. But if they help a poor pe person, it's called welfare. And they're disparaged for it. We live in what is called corporate socialism, we live in a distinctly fascist country, which is the marriage of government with corporations. Well, I think that if they would just allow shows like mine and shows like SGT Report and these big shows to just grow naturally, organically, and not censor us, not shut us down, not limit who can see us. Because when I've had shows that have just skyrocketed, the next day, it's like nothing. It's like a cliff of watches. And they just won't let anything. They've, they've figured out the algorithm now, I think, because they won't let me get popular like that. And I think they're doing it to everybody um, overall. I think if they would have organically let us grow, we would have taken over the media. And now it's it's different. Well, there's fortunately, there are some who are still successful, but they're out of the country. James Corbett's in Japan with his Corbett report, and look at this. But uh, he's still not, you know, he's still not getting the millions of views. I mean, there's some shows that we've done that should have millions of views that are not, you know, they're, they're not getting the show. When Jake Morfonios had millions of views, they just, they shut him down, essentially, and got him down to like 5,000 per video, and now maybe he can get 30,000 per video. And that's good, but it's not where he should be. Well, it's not where a, a, a lot of people should be. Uh, look at Jesse Ventura. When Jesse Ventura left the governorship, he was the most popular politician or personality in the country. So what happens is CNN and MSNBC start bidding for his services, and MSNBC wins. He was supposed to 
have the time slot that Rachel Maddow has now. And on his first show, he was going to do an expose of the war report. They called him into their office, the president's office, and there was a contract on the table and an agreement. He had to sign the agreement saying that he would support the Warren Report as NBC does. And he said, well, I can't do that. That's a bunch of BS. And they fired him. So for three years, because of his contract, he could not get a job anywhere in America. And the million or so dollars he got for them, he spent building a big casa in Mexico. It's called the, the house that NBC built. Now look where he is. He's in Russia today. Now, why is it that he has to be supported by the Russian government and not the American government? He still gets an enormous number of hits because somehow or other, because he comes from uh, uh, Russia, they're not able to fully censor him. I was on a show three, uh, three and a half weeks ago, and in 10 days, we had 45,000 hits. The sad thing is, though, he never mentioned the movie, which would have led to a lot of sales. And I only get one dollar. From, from the sale. But the movie is a runaway word of mouth hit on Amazon and Vimeo. Not only do I not get any help from the mainstream media, I get almost no help from those people, Sarah, who are in the so-called truth-seeking assassination community. Not one of them. Why? I Why would you think that would be happening? Well, because they're trying to sell $25 books. Why would they recommend... Uh, 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 one professor in America named Mark Crispin Miller, media professor, New York University, he's the only professor teaching media who shows my documentary all the time. One of his best friends is David Talbot, whom we mention in the film, and we show his uh, book, The Devil's Chessboard, which is a really good book, talking about a Alan Dulles being the planner. And, uh, and we mention a, a few other books, too. Mark sent him two or three notes saying, please look at John's movie. And when David suffered some kind of brain damage a few months ago or eight months ago, he's now fortunately survived. I wrote him a nice note and I said, you know, when I was in back surgery, I read uh, Devil's Jest Board because it was something that would get my mind off of my pain. Try to get the mind off of your pain by looking at my film, which supports your book. He's a Facebook friend and not a word from him. Why would they recommend a $2 movie that's better than the 20 best books ever? All you have to do if you're going to read a book is read Mark Lane's Rusted Judgment. It decimates the Warren Report legally. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know anything else. And the other speculation is, which is not mentioned in any of these books, I didn't put it in the film because I could not prove it. But Jim Garrison said, while uh, Alan Dulles and his ilk were the planners of the assassination, they had to get the okay from one of the owners of the country. And I said, well, who would that be? And he said, my educated guess is it was Avril Harriman. Because if you look at history... He was, uh, he was like 71 years of age. He was constantly denigrating and battling with John Kennedy. And it was his, it was his memo to John Cabot Lodge, the ambassador in Vietnam, that told him to have the CIA get rid of Diem, the peace-loving prime minister of South Vietnam who wanted an accord with Ho Chi Minh. He was murdered the first week in November, and John Kennedy was murdered less than two and a half weeks later. So Garrison said it probably came from Avril Harriman. Modify that screen again, and I have another question for you. Will you move the screen up again? Oh, gosh. I just don't want it to be in the middle of your eyes. Oh, that's it. I got to get some duct tape. You do. <laughs> Now, you say that there's 12 families that own this country. Do they actually own the shares of this country? And they are, in the sense, the real sense of a corporation, the United States is a corporation, and these 12 families actually own the shares of this United States corporation, or do they own it through having a whole bunch of equity and companies and things like that? 
Well, actually, I say 12 because I like to call them the dirty dozen. But you've had a wonderful guest on your show that I've had a couple of times on my show. His name Donald Jeffries. He wrote a really nice book, a good book called Survival of the Richest. And he claims it is eight families that own half of the wealth of the entire world. And, of course, these are the eight families that own America. And they own it because of the properties that they own, the companies that they own. And you know that... Uh, If during uh, the uh, Vietnam War, billions of dollars were made by corporations like Bell Helicopter, do you know all stock owners of stock sold on the exchange are supposed to be made public upon request? You cannot find who the major stockholders were of half of these war corporations during the Vietnam War. Yeah, you can't get to a lot of stock owners. Now, would you say of those eight families, and maybe it's in the survival of the riches, he's great, by the way, Donald Jeffrey. But would you say that they own, so you're saying they own the majority of the companies and land and things, but the actual shares of the U.S. corporation is a separate deal? No, it's it's not a separate deal. They, They own most of everything. Most of everything. And even people who are multimillionaires, and I know a few multimillionaires, you know, let me tell you something. You can, if you're smart, you can survive in any country under any system in the world. People are like cockroaches. They can survive in crap. The wealthiest man on the planet is a Mexican, for crying out loud. Who would want to live in the murder murder capital of the world? And here's the wealthiest man well, in the world. Wealthiest man of the average people. Because the families that own everything, we don't know who they are, really. I mean, they're not. They're private. You know, we do know who they are. I would love to see a book written, and I hope Donald does it, writes a book about the eight families who own America. Yeah, who they- are they? Get them to be famous. I want them all over everybody's computers so we know who they are exactly but you know you would have heard this 40 or 50 years ago in discussions in america when of course we had an active socialist party we had a half a dozen other parties and all of these people had voices in america but you know it came to a point in america where there were more more fbi agents who were members of the communist party than actual communists for kind of uh, there is no threat to this country from any country or any belief in the world. The well, biggest the enemies that, within ourselves. Yeah, yeah it, it's like uh, Pogo said in 1973, Walt Kelly, great cartoonist. He said, I've seen the enemy and it's us. The biggest enemies in our country are our own leaders. And the, their purpose is to serve themselves. It's not to serve us. And it's so tough, you know, there's no sense of community anymore more in America. We live in front of our phones. We live in front of our television sets. And we only communicate with others electronically and mechanically. We don't communicate anymore in person. And that is dreadfully, dreadfully, not only sad, but totally destructive to your psyche and to your personality and to your growth. Well, that's probably why yeah. our children have such high stress levels. There's some serious issues. Oh, monumental. Mm-hmm. Monumental. Well, how can people get your your movies? Where do they go? Well, first of all, I'll let them find some great stuff free. If you go to YouTube forward slash johnbarbersworld.com, you can see the ver- first garrison tapes absolutely free. You can see a half a dozen other terrific interviews uh, uh, about the John Kennedy murder and Jim Garrison. Plus, you can see me with Sinatra in The Tonight Show, when I Red Fox was my mentor when I started as a comic, when he was roasted on Dean Martin, I was the first one they called to roast Red. You can find a lot of that. You can find my open letters and my comments. All of this stuff is absolutely free. But if you want to see the most important, now, you know what, I hate to say this, but I will say it. When I started to make this film, I called my friends, Sarah, producers, writers, directors in L.A. and said, what's the most important movie ever made in America? 
And they would say, well, uh, Citizen Kane or The Godfather or anything. And I would say, no, that's not an important movie. It's a great movie. An important movie is like an important book that changes society. Rachel Carlson's Silent Spring made us aware of the corrupted environment. Upton Sinclair's The Jungle made us aware of contaminated food. These improved our society. Movies should have done that, but didn't, except for JFK, Oliver Stone's film. And having seen thousands of films as a 10-year film critic, I am not saying this lightly when I say the most important movie ever made is the American media and the second assassination of President John F. Kennedy because it's the only man who investigated the crime, having his own platform to tell his story unhindered by media and government, and that is Jim Garrison. And it's not an easy watch. Now, you could see that for only $2. You go to Amazon and you Google the American media, second assassination of John Kennedy. And if you don't want to watch the movie, just look at the dozens and dozens of five-star reviews or go to Vimeo where it's only $4. So that's what I would suggest. You will be staggered. And not only that, you won't be able to watch it just once. You'll have to watch it two or three times. And you also have a radio show and a website blog, correct? Well, yes, I do uh, John Barber's World on BBS Radio every second uh, Monday. As a matter of fact, I'm show, doing a show tonight with a fellow named John L. Potash. Do you know who John Potash is? I'm gonna share that with everybody. Oh, my gosh, you must have him as a guest, and you must read. This is the only guest I've had on for a third time, because he just made a documentary about his unbelievable book called Drugs as Weapons Against Us, and how the CIA yes, yes. developed drugs to murder famous people who might want to change American foreign policy. I mean, it's a staggering book. He's unbelievably pleasant and literate, and he has a new documentary out. So I, I'm having him on again uh, tonight. But I've had unbelievable people on my show, Norman Lear, Ed Asner, uh, uh, Jesse Ventura. I have tons of people on my show, and I will. Ha I even have had Dr. Judy Wood on twice. But we Nobody have to connect. We have to so I can get some of your, you know, we can forward guests to each other because <laughs> well, i got that some good guests too. Oh, I know you do. You're fabulous. If it hadn't been for Donald, I wouldn't be here talking to you. But if you just go to BBS archives of my shows and just scroll down and you see the guests, you just steal a guest list. Or if you need their contact information, I'd be more than happy to send it to you because all of these people are fabulous, even if I disagree with them. Exactly. I, Otherwise, I, you're, you're in an echo chamber. You shouldn't I, bring people on just that you only agree with. One of the brightest people I ever talked to is a, a fellow named John Robertson, who is the producer of the Hagman Report, which is an extremely conservative, uh, successful radio, television show or Internet show. John is so unbelievably articulate and a massive Trump supporter. Now, I'm sort of indifferent to Trump, as I said, except supporting his efforts to get the CIA files. And I'm thank thank God he is not Hillary. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, Hillary was awful. Okay, that, 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 yes. that that's the fifth threat. But anyway, I asked him this question, and he literally laughed out loud because I said to him on the air, John, you're one of the most intelligent, articulate people I have ever talked to. So I'm going to ask you this question: Can you name one advisor to your president, Donald J. Trump? who is your intellectual equal. And he started to chuckle because he couldn't name one. I said, okay, now I'm going to tell you something else. Google John Kennedy's advisors. You will find 18 men and women, your equal, who were advising John Kennedy. Now that's a tough question. There is nobody really smart advising Donald Trump because the truth is the man probably will not take advice. All you have to do is look back at his history of being kicked out of school for not listening to people. Well, that's I. That's a sad commentary. I, you know, I, I really want to keep hopeful that 
he's going to take down the pedophiles. He's going to take down the corruption. He's going to want to make a huge difference because the corruption is so bad that if he decides he's going to do something, someone like him could do it just because he, his attitude might, you know. He has already successfully started dismantling these pedophile rings. So good for him in that respect. And I have seen, uh, I have friends who are very strong Trump supporters who are dear friends of mine on Facebook and strong supporters of me, this atheistic radical for crying out loud. And they're always, when they sign off, they always say, God bless you, John, which is really, really sweet. But you go to some of their sites, you will find that they list some accomplishments by Donald Trump that are not reported in, oh, the, absolutely. Mainstream, in the mainstream media. He's had a lot of accomplishments that aren't reported. He's been doing some, actually, some pretty darn good things behind the scenes. And and I keep saying this, just reducing the corporate tax rate to average in the world, average in the world. Now, the big corporations are all getting their, their uh, loopholes and everything else. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the small business down the street that now has a competitive tax rate with other countries in this world. We were and the also, highest in the world. And that also That's a big deal. It is, and he's also working on a promise to reverse NAFTA, which was one of the promises he made when he was campaigning. And it's worth voting for him if he just succeeds in doing that and getting yes. manufacturing back in America. I do not understand why the stock market is so successful when we don't make anything. Yeah. It is a mystery to me. We have some we have some fundamental foundational problems that need to be fixed, and I I think he's on a lot of that. And if he can fix that, I I have a problem with uh, child sex abuse. I think we have a major corruption problem with that, and I would like to see that cleaned up. And I think he's on that as well. And that I think is tied to a lot of the corruption that we see at a big picture. It's awful, but it needs to be cleaned up. Corruption is taking down our country, and that's one of the main reasons, along with maybe the cabal not wanting good people to rise to the top. But when you have co corrupt people at to on the top, they don't want the best and the brightest to the be the ones leading. You know, and the saddest thing is, many, many Americans believe that Donald J. Trump may indeed be corrupt. There was a wonderful documentary made about him uh um, Libby Landros, I believe, made it. It was suppressed for about 10 years because it revealed how he made his money in real estate in New York. And it's very unsavory, and it indicates, indeed, he may actually be, uh, be corrupt. Now, a lot of Americans know that, but you know what? The sad thing is they're not upset about it. The sad, what it is that Americans are saying well, he got his. I hope I get mine. Yeah, we don't want that. We need this corruption changed. But there's levels of corruption, too. And I know this sounds terrible. You know, there's levels. Taking advantage of children and using that as a way to bribe people and control people, to me, is a whole nother level of corruption. That, that's not just corrupt corruption. I mean, that is outright total evil. <laughs> and that is what we got to get rid of. How you, you, you just think about it? How on earth could anyone get any kind of satisfaction sexually out of copulating with a child when a child can't experience it? it so it's not it's not sex, it's cruelty, it's bondage, and it's control, and it has nothing to do with sex. They just use that to exert their power and control over people. It's sick. I, I but that stuff is rampant. And it is. It's, it need that evil, whatever we have. There's corruption, which is bad, but it's not as bad as that level of evil. Well, and you we, know, I, I will close by saying this, Sarah, and I've said it often. It all began on November twenty second, nineteen sixty three. All of it began. It laid the foundation for the corruption, the fake wars, the pedophilia, everything that is wrong with America. In that respect, Jimmy Carter was right. But you know, it's like a knitted sweater. And this is the one string, the only string you have to pull to unravel that sweater. 
if you reopen the case that is an open case at the Justice Department and actually go in and investigate that murder, which Jim Garrison already solved, you will get to and solve all of the problems in America. We'll leave it with that. So thank you so much for being on my show. Oh, you're a delight. And uh, get a dog trainer. Because <laughs> I'm not that good at it. You'll stick around for about 10 minutes for my patrons. Oh, sure, sure. Are you having trouble losing weight? It could be due to insulin levels that are out of balance. Learn what fat flushing food helps balance your insulin levels. It's basically a hormone that determines how much fat your body stores. Over 240,000 women have successfully melted unwanted fat off their body fast, faster than you would think possible, keeping it off for good. Learn how so many people have melted fat so quickly. Click the link below.